good morning or afternoon or whenever. Uh, this is the uh, first presentation uh, of uh, DAAC 1304, and we're going to be looking at uh, drug society and human behavior. The first two chapters uh, in week one of your course, and um, we'll be uh, just basically taking an overview of uh, drugs of abuse, what they are, why we should be concerned, language that we use, what we're talking about, how we define the problem, how society responds to the problems that we define, and some meat and potatoes things to get us started into this uh, uh, semester. And I'm happy to have all of you here. Um, and uh, without... Uh, Further introduction, uh, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can't uh, share my screen with you, if I can remember how to do that, uh, which I think I just did, but maybe I didn't. There it is. Uh, yay. I'm kind of rusty at this. I haven't done it in a couple of weeks, and it's amazing how fast I can forget stuff on the <laughs> with using a computer. Uh, so, uh, Drug Society and Human Behavior, uh, Chapter 1, Drug Use, an overview, uh, which is exactly what it is. Uh, and uh, when we're, when we're doing this, we're going to try to develop an analytical framework for understanding any specific drug use issues um, and uh, describe some principles that we're going to be applying throughout the course um, and kind of set a groundwork or a framework by which we can understand what it is that we're looking at and address uh, uh, drug issues in our society. There are a few things that we need to remember moving forward. Uh, and the first thing that we need to remember is that drug use is not necessarily abuse. And we're gonna, we'll are gonna be talking about these terms a good deal, uh, not just in these courses that you're taking here at Lee College, but throughout your uh, professional career. Uh, we, st uh, you know, we still struggle over whether we ought to, you know, hyphenate codependent uh, or, or spell it as one word. Uh, but uh, abuse, addiction, uh, the language that we'll be using, we'll be uh, moving back and forth between basically what's lay terminology, the language that you hear people, uh, you know, talk about, uh, use talking about drugs every day, and clinical type terms, professional terms that we would use to communicate more specific ideas and aspects of drug use. Uh, so using a drug is not necessarily abusing a drug. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll discuss that more in depth moving forward. Also that drugs alleviate suffering for millions of human beings and other animals every day. Thank God for drugs. Thank God for phar pharmaceuticals. Thank God for this uh, uh, vaccine that's uh, you know been developed for COVID-19, for penicillin, for antibiotics and other antibiotics, for anesthesias. Uh, you know, drugs cure disease. Uh, drugs alleviate suffering. Drugs make us better. But drugs also have some drawbacks to them, too, especially if you're using them in a sort of a recreational sense. Uh, also, we have to consider that most people who, uh, who use drugs and even those who abuse drugs, you, who misuse them, do not become addicted to them. <coughs> <coughs> there is no drug that you use one time and boom, you're automatically addicted to it. Repetition of use is a defining <coughs> factor of drug dependency. And when you start talking about this, by the way, uh, with dependencies and abuse and what have you, you have to remember that addiction is an illness. It's not a choice. Substance use disorder 
is not something that people choose to have. If they did, who in the hell would make that choice? I mean, you know, uh, given all of the misery that it brings with it, why wouldn't you just wake up in the morning and say enough of that uh, and choose something else? Well, it's not that easy. What problem? Drug problem? What problem? Who's got a problem? Which problem are you talking about? Uh, depends on who you ask and, and, and when. Uh, if you look at the images over here on the left, you see some weed, that little old herb that God put here for, uh, for us to enjoy, and it's not addictive or anything like that, etc. cetera. Uh, that's, uh, that's not true, of course. God put Karari here too. Enjoy some of that. Your life expectancy will be less than 15 seconds. Uh, the uh, uh, upper left image is a meth lab uh, that is in a kitchen somewhere. You can see the sink in the background uh, and, the, and the cabinets uh, for uh, pharmaceutical entrepreneurs. Uh, on, you know, in your neighborhoods. And uh, the, what happens sometimes when the local operations <laughs> are discovered. Uh, the drug problem, it, are all of these part of the drug problem? It's all part of a drug problem. Drug problem is not something that's monolithic. Uh, it's not just one big thing that everybody looks at and recognizes immediately. Uh, in fact, it's pretty complicated. Uh, and we have to consider use, people who use drugs. It, if you smoke weed at a party uh, with some old friends after a high school reunion, is that a drug problem? Well, it could be if you get loaded and wreck your car, or it could be if uh, uh, you get loaded and sleep with your old girlfriend and your wife doesn't approve of it, or it could be uh, if the police come in and you're sitting there and uh, 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 you're a licensed professional of some sort, not just an LCDC, but a policeman or a, or a judge or a doctor or a nurse, it could become an immediate problem if you got arrested. Uh, then there's uh, abuse. And when people talk about abuse, uh, that's... Uh, uh, that's a, a, a different language than uh, uh, than use. Also, what people who uh, when people use the term abuse, they're generally talking about misuse. You know, using drugs for reasons for which they're not intended, uh, or uh, uh, illicit drug use, using uh, drugs that are illegal. Dependence is a whole other. Uh, ball game and dependence on the dr uh, on drugs is complicated, but that basically, when you depend upon something, you rely on it. You need it. It becomes necessary to you, and we'll talk about that more in depth as as we move forward. And addiction is uh, another way of talking about that uh, dependency, except addiction. <clears throat> has a, another element, ha, has some other elements to it as well. There's physiological addiction. If, um, uh, you know, if you stop using the drug, withdrawal symptoms, things like that. Physiological addiction in terms of changes that go on in the brain that create cravings and obsessions and things like uh, uh, of that nature. All of these things taken together is what we're talking about when we're talking about a substance use disorder. It encompasses all of these other ideas, uh, but it also sets out a more uh, logical, reasonable way of, of identifying, you know, what's going on with an individual, and it creates a way particularly uh, for uh, professionals who are uh, trying to identify uh, an issue, the severity of the issue, and come up with interventions. It gives us a language and concepts by which we can communicate with one another uh, and to the client, to their benefit. DSM-5 uh, describes a continuum. That DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, uh, 
fifth edition of the uh, American Psychiatric Association. Uh, and this continuum moves away from terms such as abuse and dependence that were, you know, in all of the early incarnations of the DSM. And it uh, uh, basically describes all human beings lying on this continuum between non-use and, you know, total addiction. And every human being who's ever lived and who's living now falls on that continuum somewhere. I'm on the don't use continuum for the most part. I'm not recreationally into using drugs, but there are some uh, medicines that I have to take because, you know, hey, uh, as you get older, you have to take some medicines sometimes. But, <clears throat> you know, regulate things. Uh, but when we're using drugs, we have to also keep in, uh, uh, keep in mind that there is no magic bullet, that every drug that we take uh, you know, has multiple effects. When I was a kid, I used to see, uh, well, I'm even up and through my adulthood too, but I used to see commercials for products on television. One of them I saw was Anison, fast, fast, fast relief. And they'd show a little uh, cartoon of a head with a, you know, a hammer beating on an anvil for a headache. Uh, but if you take Anison, it goes right up there and knocks that, um, uh, knocks the uh, uh, anvil, uh, hammer and anvil effect out, and it does it quickly. Uh, Anison has a bunch of things in it, uh, and some of them are analgesic. Uh, but the, uh, Anison could also give you upset stomachs. Anison can, uh, uh, can cause your blood to not clot as well. Everything that you take, Everything, and you can underline that, has multiple effects. There are no drugs that do just one thing. So our focus then, when we're looking at uh, <clears throat> what the drug problem is, and again, uh, uh, you know, uh, it it's, depends a lot on who you ask. If you ask uh, uh, what the drug problem is for a law enforcement um, agent, for instance, an officer of the law, uh, they may be talking about uh, controlling controlled substances. Who can have what? What's legal for you to have and use? And what the law should do about it? We have legal sanctions that regulate who can use, when they can use, what they can have, when they can hold it, etc., and so forth. So uh, we take that into consideration. Who's using the drug? Well, uh, you know, if you're using a, a prescribed opiate painkiller for a condition that you have uh, and you have a prescription for it, then it's not an illegal drug. If you're using that same opiate for fun uh, or because you're feeding a, a, an addiction and you don't have a prescription for it, then it's a crime. Uh, if you're using... Uh, Another substance like heroin, uh, which is a totally illegal substance, has no legal uh, uses in the United States, uh, then what comes into play? What drug are you using? And also who's using it? Why you're using it? You know, uh, if, are you self-medicating? Are you following a regimen of... Uh, uh, medication is prescribed by your doctor, and you can still get in a world of trouble uh, taking medications that your doctor prescribes exactly the way the doctor prescribes it. That doesn't mean that there are not bumps in that particular road, because they are. Uh, when you're using the drug, if I'm sitting out on my porch in the afternoon, uh, say 5.30ish in the cocktail hour, and having myself a nice cold can of beer with my feet kicked up and you drive by and see me on the porch doing that, you may think, well, look there, uh, you know, end of a work day and he's unwinding. He's been at work and, uh, you know, this is how he relaxes and stuff. But what do you think if you drive by at 5.30 in the morning and I'm sitting on that same front porch having a can of beer? Uh, are you going to judge it differently? Chances are you are going to judge it differently. Uh, 
red flags may go up immediately. Someone who's drinking beer at 5.30 in the morning and the sun's not even up yet, good. Uh, there's implications to that. Uh, you know, people who wake up drinking or what kind of people? Yeah, you got it. They're alcoholics. They're problem drinkers. Truth of the matter is, maybe I work a rotating shift and I just got off of work. Uh, it's still the end of my day and I'm relaxing. Does that necessarily mean I have a problem? Or maybe I'm just one of those guys who likes to drink a lot and I started drinking when I got off to uh, got off of work at the uh, swing shift, the uh, uh, 3 to 11 shift. And so I started drinking right after I was able to get to, uh, uh, to the uh, store and buy some alcohol, and I haven't stopped yet. Uh, how I'm drinking has something to do with it. Or maybe again, going back to what? That's not how I like to unwind. Maybe what I'd rather do is shoot some heroin uh, and you see me doing that on my porch, or, uh, or huff some volatile inhalants, uh, some paint thinner, something along those lines. Uh, you know, again, and who? So it's not me that you see doing this. It's a pregnant woman. It's a kid who's, a, a, you know, a teenager or younger, preteen, uh, you know. Where are we when we're doing this? How are we doing it? Am I snorting it, drinking it, smoking it, shooting it, getting a bum's rush, which is an enema with drugs in it? Uh, you know, uh, why am I doing it? Why does do come into play, but not so much as these other things? Uh, and we tend to put the cart before the horse sometimes. The why a person is using uh, is important, but it's not the most important. Psychoactive substances are, uh, uh, are what we're going to be looking at. They're going to be our primary focus in this in terms of what people uh, are using. There are a number of pharmacologies that are off offered at Lee College and they uh, have a different focus for different programs. If you're in the nursing program and you think this is the pharmacology class that you're supposed to have, no it's not and you should get that straightened out right away. Same as if you're uh, going into health information technology, medical records, they'll have a different uh, pharmacology course. So uh, this is a pharmacology course for uh, the addictions counseling and ours is gonna be the pharmacology of addictive substances. So our focus is gonna be on the drugs of abuse, the uh, so-called controlled substances and the legal substances that cause a lot of problems for us too. Uh, we'll also look at pharmacological agents that are used in the treatment of substance use disorders. Those are important. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're making advances all the time on medical assisted treatment, medicine, assist, uh, <coughs> medication assisted treatments uh, or mats that uh, uh, we use primarily. Uh, these are used with uh, opioids, and, uh, but uh, they can be used with other. Uh, substance use disorders as well. So, uh, and if we're going to be talking about drugs and drugs of abuse, then what we're talking about actually is psychoactive agents. And in order for a drug to be psychoactive, it has to pass through the blood-brain barrier that's uh, up here uh, between the skull and the brain itself. It's a tightly masked capillary layer. Uh, and uh, it filters things. And the drug has to get through the blood-brain barrier and it has to alter ongoing neurochemical processes in the brain. It has to alter normal brain functioning. And that's what causes you to have a high. There are tons of myths that we're gonna address moving forward through this semester. Uh, in this class and in other classes worse, uh, uh, in other classes as well. Uh, uh, and one of the myths is that uh, drug use, the drug, the drug problem being, you know, the pervasiveness of drugs, the, the magnitude of use, etc., is worse now than ever before. And nope, it's really not. Drug use in uh, the United States of America peaked in 1981. Uh, 
That's just around the time I stopped, by the way, <laughs> just before I stopped. I, I take a lot of credit for that. I sobered up in 1982, so it was no wonder it fell off, right? Uh, it, uh, it's been pretty much on the decline. Now, that there, there, if, you, if you're into statistics and you like to track things, and I know some of you are, uh, if you uh, do longitudinal uh, studies of data over time, you'll see that there are spikes uh, in, uh, in, in, in drug use, and that we often have a drug du jour, a drug of the day, that's uh, really popular uh, you know, right now, or it's a new thing that's hit the scene, or something that's uh, uh, recycled and regained popularity again. Uh, but uh, you, you'll see some spikes there, but pretty much uh, drug use has been relatively level. It doesn't change a lot one way uh, or another. And the decline that we see from 1981 is not a particularly dramatic decline, but it has been a steady uh, decline. Uh, and that's a good thing. And what it indicates is that a number of the things that we're doing out there works. Uh, and that's something else that we need uh, to discuss. I didn't put it on my list, but that is that, uh, uh, that treatment works. And we're not the best at getting that information out there. There's a myth that, uh, you know, that uh, you know, treatment centers are just about making money and it doesn't do any one any good and yada, yada, yada. Uh, that's not true, and I'll be uh, you know, doing things throughout uh, the course of your education here at Lee College to convince you of that. Uh, it's a personal choice. My body, I'm, I'm not hurting anyone else. It's all on me. Uh, nope, again. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, people using drugs in our society is a tremendous drain on our resources and causes us problems all up and down. Uh, you know, uh, medical, uh, law enforcement, insurance costs, uh, you know, is pervasive. There's, there's ways that drug use uh, uh, is detrimental to our society and to individuals in the society uh, that we normally just don't think about. We don't even, you know, consider how uh, uh, we can be affected by this. And everyone in the United States is affected by drug use in one way or another. Uh, harsher punishment deters drug use. Nope, some more. Uh, uh, you know, you can uh, you can lock me up, beat me up. Uh, you know, hell, you can kill me if you want to. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna. St well, if you kill me, I'll stop. Probably, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, up to up to that, there's really no way uh, that uh, you can do things to me to make me stop using drugs. Uh, and uh, having known lots of convicts uh, and offenders in my life, I've seen a mindset that's there. Uh, and when you've perfected that mindset of not giving one single second hand damn for what other, person, other people think or what they do to you. Uh, in fact, you can kind of put yourself outside of the realm of being punished. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me. So, you know, knock yourself out. Decriminalizing drugs encourages drug use. Nope. But it seems like it would, huh? Uh, it seems like if you said, okay, I'm not going to put you in jail anymore for doing this, that everybody's going to rush right out uh, and do that, right? Uh, if I say, you know, that uh, jaywalking is not going to be a crime anymore, everybody's going to rush right out to jaywalk. If I can say that not buckling your seatbelt is okay with us, everybody's going to stop using them, right? Uh, uh, you know, you get my drift. Decriminalizing something doesn't encourage uh, drug use, and criminalizing uh, something uh, doesn't discourage it. Uh, even though we have, for instance, uh, cops 
who hide on the side of the road with radar guns and write us tickets and stuff like that for going too fast. This makes people slow down, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, epidemiological studies done on, uh, on how traffic enforcement works indicate that most people are gonna drive as comfortable as they feel driving, regardless what the speed limit is. Uh, and uh, ah, then we got sneaky and we use the unmarked cars, really the stealth cars, they are marked, but you have to be right beside them to be able to tell it, right? They're concealed. Uh, that'll stop them, they'll be afraid of that. No, we won't. If you really want to stop people from speeding, just park a police car on the side of the road. There doesn't even have to be anyone in it. When they see the car, they'll slow down. And that will work. But that's like hiding your drugs by throwing it way up high in the air. That works too, but for very short periods of time, right? <laughs> Gravity? Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that. Drug use causes crime. Well, yes and no. Uh, some drug use is a crime, and we'll talk about that later too. We'll talk about that a little later in this lecture. Uh, if you're using an illicit substance, if you're using something that's illegal for you to have, to even have, much less put in you, then that's criminal. Uh, uh, you have to engage in behavior to acquire that drug, and that's criminal too. Uh, and these are kind of related type crimes. That's not something that's caused. Uh, some drugs, though, uh, lower your inhibition. That you're not in your right mind. Actually, technically, you're insane when you're loaded, you know, if you think about it. And I mean that literally. Uh, you know, you're, you're not perceiving things right. You're not processing information right. Your impulse control is lowered your uh, driving behaviors increased, et cetera, and so forth, then you may do something. You might uh, start a fight or assault someone, or, uh, you know, even be to engage in violence against yourself. Uh, and that's a drug-induced crime. And a drug-induced crime is very different than a drug-related crime. Uh, I, I am a crack dealer, and I have told this boy, Bobby, Stop selling dope over here at the intersection of Yada and Yah, uh, you know, because that's my territory, and Bobby insists on selling drugs there. So I assault him a couple of times and beat him up, and he still keeps doing it. And then so I just take him out. I go by and I shoot him. Uh, and uh, I'm not high. I'm not under the influence of drugs when I'm doing this. This is just business, you know. Uh, and it's the way business is conducted when you're into some of these endeavors. Uh, that's a drug-related crime. Uh, I'm at a bar, uh, and uh, I see a guy looking at me at the end of the bar, and I say to him, what are you looking at? And he said, I ain't figured it out yet. And away we go, and one of us uh, hurts the other, shoots the other, something like that. That is drug-induced crime. We probably wouldn't do something like that if we weren't loaded. Uh, and we'll talk about how the, those are risk factors later on. By the way, uh, uh, you know, people are always, we also are trying to look at uh, ideas of hard drugs versus soft drugs. Uh, the drug that's associated with violence, the drug that's associated with sexual assaults, the drug that is associated with drug-induced crime is alcohol. You can take all of the other drugs combined, roll them up in a bundle, and they don't touch alcohol. That's one of the biggest drug problems that we have in this country. Alcohol and tobacco combined create more problems for people in the United States of America than all of Big Pharma in every illegal operation. And those are some myths and a few hundred other things, by the way, uh, that uh, we believe about drugs, such that they'll make me smarter, taller, sexier, wittier, and all of that stuff if I drink. Uh, no, if I drink, it makes me drunk. All of those other things, I don't know. 
but it doesn't create that for me. So why do people use anyway? And even a bigger question, why should we care that they use? If drug use is just about feeling good, why wouldn't I want to pack a good four-finger bag of weed in these little fellows' lunch for them every morning before they go uh, to work and some rolling papers and matches, maybe a bong? Uh, you know, why shouldn't I encourage them to smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol, that kind of thing, if it's just about, uh, uh, you know, feeling good and it's a harmless thing? Uh, and the reason we care is it's not a harmless thing. And especially if you're that age and start using. The younger you are when you start using, the more likely you are to develop a substance use disorder. Uh, and the more likely you are to develop it soon. Uh, what may take an adult, someone who starts you, their drug use in their 20s, for instance, uh, what may they can still develop a substance use disorder, but it may take them years to get there. These guys can develop it in months. There are lots of reasons that people will give you about uh, why they use drugs. And, you know, if we were sitting in a classroom together and I could interact with you in that manner, I'd probably ask you, uh, you know, what kind of reasons can you think of uh, that people would give for, uh, for using drugs? And I've heard lots of them over the years, uh, but these are fairly, fairly common ones. Curiosity. I've heard about this stuff and I wonder about it. Uh, and, you know, I am willing to give it a try to see what happens. Uh, that uh, you may be a thrill seeker, by the way, and that may be a risk factor for you. Uh, and um, uh, that may be a part of your personality that is somewhat predictive of having uh, a substance use or developing a substance use disorder. Or you may be susceptible to peer pressure uh, that someone says to you, oh, come on, and you uh, give in uh, to that. You may be uh, someone who is... Um, you know, who really invest in wanting to be accepted by a particular group or something uh, and, and succumb to, uh, to that and uh, take a, and, you know, give in. Uh, you may want to escape worries and you watch television. You see that, uh, you know, one way that you can always escape worries is to have a, have a drink, use a drug. Uh, and uh, that's how you avoid the unpleasantries of your life, or that you're doing it to enhance social experiences, uh, to make things easier for you in a social setting. This is particularly uh, uh, critical if you happen to be an adolescent, like you're learning how to develop uh, uh, relationships with, uh, uh, you know, friendships and uh, romantic relationships too. Uh, and uh, you're learning how to interact with your peers and build these relationships and all of that kind of good stuff. When I was uh, younger, uh, oh, well, it, nothing really has changed. I, I like girls, and uh, uh, my wife's one. Uh, well, she's not a girl anymore, but, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, girls are kind of... Um, uh, scary. Uh, and, you know, if you're uh, going to, like, go to a club and, and, uh, and try to strike up a, a, a conversation or, uh, you know, do, pick someone up at the club, you risk rejection. Uh, but uh, one of the cool things about being in a club is you can medicate that rejection so that if I have a couple of drinks, uh, I can go up to a lady there and uh, start a conversation. And uh, maybe with a couple more drinks, I feel very comfortable asking her to dance and getting out on the dance floor. And, you know, my anxiety is decreased. Uh, and after a couple of more drinks, I'll ask her daddy to dance. I don't give a damn. Uh, you know, so 
And it feels like this is doing something for me in, in terms of making it easier for me to interact and to do certain things. But I'm not learning any really good coping skills. And if your idea of asking someone out on a date is you want to go up to my place and do a couple of lines, you've probably got some uh, work to do on your social skills. Relaxation, I'm uptight, I can't unwind, I can't relax. It's amazing how many people who uh, are prone to having substance use disorders have this particular situation in their lives too. Uh, but what I, would, uh, uh, what I would say about these reasons is these are reasons to use. These are not reasons that explain substance use disorders. These are not ways of understanding what happens to people who develop a, a, a dependency on substances. Curiosity is satisfied once you've used the drug. Why do you go back and do it again? Peer pressure is, uh, you know, once yielded to, it's gone. Why are you going back and using the drug again? Escape from worries. If they come back, you didn't escape. <laughs> you know? but, uh, so it didn't work. Why use again? Enhance social experiences. Are you going to learn from this and move forward? Or are you going to have to use a drug every time you try to interact with people? Is it that you're going to need the drug forever to relax? Uh, you can't relax otherwise. What you're talking about here, for the most part, is self-medication. This isn't social use. This is a, a, a stepping down process that you wind up in trouble with. And we'll talk about that a lot, a lot, you know, over the course of the next uh, few weeks, months, and years. Uh, so uh, uh, those are reasons but uh, for use, but they are not reasons for addiction. Subjectively, people use again and come back to it again because it feels good. I mean, there's something that's attractive about uh, the drug use. And I like that. I enjoy being drunk. Now, I'm, I'm true confessions time, and this is our first date. I don't know if I should be laying all this out on the first date. But uh, uh, this is, uh, 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 I am not someone who will sniff and uh, sip on wine or anything like that. Uh, uh, I don't like what a couple of drinks feels like in my body. I'm an affect drinker. If I'm going to drink, I drink to become intoxicated. That's why I do it. It's not because I like a good tart wine with my beef on Friday night. Uh, and I know that there are people out there who are like that. I'm just not one of them. Uh, and uh, I never was. And so, you know, I've kind of stopped lying to myself about that many years ago. Uh, so uh, I am more the small print kind of guy. And often, at least for those with substance use disorders, I, I use to keep from feeling bad because the thing that makes me feel good also makes me feel bad when it wears off and I have a rebound effect and it makes me uncomfortable and I want to use uh, some more. I don't understand the concept of social drinking hardly at all. I understand it at a, at a, intellectually, but on an emotional level, I don't get it. Why do you want to just have a drink? It's like kissing your sister. Where's the skyrockets in that? A solid starting point to understanding drug use, once again, is to remember that drug use is, uh, I, I shouldn't have phrased it that way. Drugs are neither good or bad. Use can be, uh, you know, it can be uh, adaptive or maladaptive, good or bad, whatever. Uh, but drugs themselves can't. That, that you can't give moral capability uh, to a drug. They're just not uh, good or bad. Uh, heroin, uh, cocaine, you can pile up, uh, you know, a hill of cocaine up in my front yard and it's not going to stalk me and do anything to me. It's not going to jump on me. 
uh, I have to use that drug in order to uh, uh, have for it to have an effect on me. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe if the wind's blowing in the right direction, I can breathe a lot of it. And that's an act of God and not my fault. Uh, but, uh, you know, th there are multiple effects. Again, uh, I had surgery a few years back and they gave me Oxycontin. Uh, I mean, not Oxycontin, hydrocodone for this, for this surgery. And uh, it's the medication that I took uh, while I was recovering. And I was very religious with it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, my uh, wife, who's a nurse, took charge of it. And she made sure that I wasn't taking it inappropriately and that I was doing it when and under the circumstances that the doctor had prescribed it. And a weird thing happened to me. Uh, when I ran out of medication, I decided I wasn't going to get it refilled because I could now manage the, manage the pain. There was still some pain there, but it wasn't, you know, something that I couldn't handle. Uh, and then I got what we call dope sick. Uh, so even though I took the medication exactly the way the medication was prescribed and my wife ensured that I was doing that, I had withdrawal. And that's because of the uh, 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 the multiple effects that the drugs cause me. The positive effect, the, the, the clinical outcome that I was seeking, I got, which was pain relief. But the side effects that I wasn't seeking, I got too, which was with low dosages at the beginning, I got high. And I liked that feeling. It wasn't out of control high, but when I take narcotic drugs, it gives me a buzz if I haven't uh, taken them in a long time. But because I am uh, substance use disorder, uh, if uh, I continue to take that drug, say one pill every four hours, you know, for pain as needed, four to six hours as needed, uh, in no time at all, it does nothing to me. I have no buzz. I don't get that effect. And if I want, that's called tolerance. We'll talk about that later on too. If I want to get that effect, I have to up the dosage. But even if I'm not getting the buzz, even if I'm not getting the effect, my body, my addicted body does, you know, it recognizes immediately what's going on. Uh, and when I stop, uh, I'll have withdrawal syndrome. Uh, so if I have to take something like that, uh, and I have had, uh, uh, you know, I have to look forward to how I'm going to stop. I have to look forward to where, how I'm going to titrate the dosages down, decrease, step down the dosages instead of just taking these uh, medications for a week or 10 days or however long and then just stopping uh, because when I do that, uh, chances are I'll have withdrawal. We'll talk about that phenomenon a little later on. Expectations influences the way uh, that people experience drugs, what they hope to get, what they hope to accomplish, how they want it to be, etc., uh, is, uh, is, is important uh, as well. So... Uh, and then there's, again, that subjectivity of experience that uh, I talked about earlier, how we see things, how we uh, evaluate our experiences, what we're hoping to get, and, uh, and how we uh, uh, organize that experience for ourselves. Crazy Cat and Ignatz, uh, a tale of the eye of the beholder. George Jer uh, Joseph Harriman was an American cartoonist uh, who, who uh, was born in 1880, died in 1944. And so he was dead uh, uh, some years before I was ever born. Uh, but this, uh, his cartoons, I'm, and I'm a cartoon era kid, man, you know, I was a comic book fanatic and things when I was a youngster. Uh, but uh, these, these three characters, this is a crazy cat, 
and this is Ignatz Mouse, and this is Officer Pup. Uh, and what you're saying here is a, a, a study in a, a couple of things. One is this is a romantic triangle, believe it or not. Crazy Cat loves Ignatz Mouse. Uh, and Ignatz is not a lovable character. He's mean, he's petty, uh, he's always cruel to her, and as you can see now, he's smacking her in the head with a brick. Uh, and what, what you see over here uh, coming from her, her thought is love. Uh, so Ignatz is paying her attention, even though he's braining her with a, with a brick, and she interprets that as affection. Uh, and this might be something I should talk about more in a family class or relationships class than a pharmacology class. Uh, but uh, uh, for her, that's um, a, a positive thing, what's going on. Uh, over here, Officer Pup loves Crazy Cat and is always doing good things for her and things like that. And he will take Ignat's mouth to jail every once in a while for his cruelties and excesses in the way he treats her. Uh, but she keeps, you know, returning. And you can see up here, he's seeing what's going on. It's a transgression. Uh, Ignat's mouse is uh, violating the law, which is a bad thing. And he's assaulting this poor kitty, which is a bad thing, etc. and so forth. And Pup will probably uh, take her to jail. Ignat's uh, is totally uh, self-centered. He only sees what's in it for him. Uh, and uh, Crazy Cat, uh, well, her name's Crazy, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, interprets this as love. Uh, and Officer Pup interprets it as sin. Uh, and that is the whole storyline of Crazy Cat comics back in the day. And, uh, you know, you can, if this sort of thing interests you, you can look them up. Uh, there's some heavy uh, literary value in these things. Uh, but w what they're doing and why they're doing it is influenced a great deal uh, uh, in terms of uh, responses from each of the individuals in here that, uh, have their own issues, their own uh, sacrifices, their own payoffs, and, and this sort of thing. And drug use is uh, very much the same way in our society. It depends on where you're standing. Society looks at drug use in one way, uh, and there are a lot of factors that influences, uh, you know, societal responses, interventions, whether we uh, you know, whether we tolerate this drug use, um, you know, how we, how society responds to it. Uh, uh, and you can read this as well as I can, but laws and penalties are a societal response. We try to uh, uh, regulate. Regulation is the way that American society uh, tends to want to deal with uh, substance use. Availability and cost is another thing. Uh, and you have to take this into consideration. Simple economics. If you can take $3,000 and turn it into a million dollars in a few weeks, uh, you know, now you're cooking with gas, huh? Uh, so as long as the huge profits are there in illegal substance use, then, uh, you know, isn't there's going to be a, a, a market for it. Uh, but there's also... Uh, the legal substances too, tobacco, alcohol, pharmaceuticals, etc., that are, are, are legal or at least legal under certain circumstances. Political statements. Everybody has to be sort of against drug use in America, right? Uh, if you're a politician, especially, huh? Uh, uh, Anti-drug commercials, alcohol and tobacco ads. You don't see those on TV. Uh, anymore, but you can still see them in print and on the internet. And uh, and tobacco companies will send you things in the mail. I still get them, uh, you know, from Marlboro and what have you. Uh, uh, statements by authorities and celebrities—they're you know doing uh, 
uh, portrayal in news articles and shows, you can see a lot of drug use on television and movies and things like that. In the community and around the family, these are the factors that influence what we do. Uh, I've always encouraged uh, parents to talk to their kids about drug use, including tobacco and alcohol and things like that, because in the end, kids really do listen to you. Uh, peers, what the people around you are doing. Church, what your religious beliefs are. Gangs, which are surrogate families, and we'll talk about that a little later on too. Uh, local police, clubs, organizations, schools. And then there's the individual personality. And these uh, 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 knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs are, are very, very important. Uh, when we're talking about recovery, it's very, very important also when we're talking about prevention because knowledge drives attitudes and attitudes drives beliefs and beliefs drives knowledge or partial knowledge or what we think is knowledge, uh, you know. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, your beliefs don't change reality. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to say this without being political. Uh, COVID-19 is still um, an issue. I mean, there's a vaccine, yes, but it's not widely available to everyone yet. And COVID-19 is still an issue. Listen to me. It's not a hoax. It's not something people are doing to trick you. It's not something that people are doing to try to take your personal freedoms away from you. It's a freaking virus. And a mask will prevent you from spreading it to other people. And if it's a good mask, it will prevent other people from spreading it uh, to you, you know? Why is this important? It should be obvious. We want to reduce the spread of the illness. We want to uh, decrease the cases. Uh, herd immunity may come, but it will be at a high cost. You know, I can preach to people about the evils of drug use. I don't, but I can. Uh, and uh, it's not going to override their personal drug experience, you know. We had these kind of things going on when I was in school, too. I'd go into the auditorium and they'd bring some convicts down from Huntsville in white uh, jumpsuits and, uh, uh, you know, their uh, tattoos all over them and look like they just swung down fresh from the trees. Uh, and they're telling us all about the horrible things that will happen to us uh, if we use drugs. Uh, and me and my buddies... Uh, uh, my buddies and I <laughs> would be sitting uh, in the back with their feet up on the, uh, you know, the, the seats and saying, yeah, but you're losers, uh, and we're not, <laughs> you know, we're, uh, we're different. Uh, and that's, that's something that you hear from a lot of substance use disordered people. You don't understand, I'm different. Uh, yeah, I do understand, and you're not. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, then there are motives and needs, biology, and all of this stuff uh, influences how uh, we do drugs. And if I look forward to using and I see it as a harmless thing or, or even a beneficial thing, then uh, you're going to be hard-pressed to sell me on the idea of sobriety. And that's uh, 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 something we need to keep in mind, too. Vocabulary, but if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. George Orwell, 1984. Uh, and uh, people who read Orwell, uh, you know, ought to go into it with the idea that as much as anything else, 1984 is a study in linguistics. What can you say uh, when Newspeak uh, has corrupted the language so much that the worst thing you can say about Big Brother is that he is double plus ungood. Uh, hard to get a revolution started with that kind of language, huh? Drug is a big word, but in a general sense, what we're talking about when we uh, uh, say drug is that it's a chemical that in some way alters the organism. And in terms of psychoactivity, it's a way 
that alters the organism's emotions and thoughts and perceptions. Legal drugs, uh, like we were talking about, like, like I was talking about a while ago, uh, may be controlled substances. Uh, and diazepam, for instance, uh, that, that's a controlled substance that's legal if you have a prescription for them. If you have the bottle and your name's on the bottle and your doctor prescribed it for you, it's legal. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, you can still get busted for being under the influence if you're driving and the officer deems you as being uh, impaired. But, uh, but the substances are legal. You're not going to go to jail just because you have them, right? Alcohol and tobacco products, they're legal if you're of age. Uh, and so if you're uh, uh, 20 years, uh, uh, you know, 364 days, and you haven't, you know, it's not tomorrow, and it's not, uh, you're not 21 yet, then your tobacco uh, products and your uh, alcohol are illegal, and you can be in trouble for it. Uh, but if you wait till midnight and, and, and let the clock roll over uh, to where you're 21, uh, it will be totally legal. And that thing that you were not mature enough to do 12 hours ago, you can now do. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Illicit drugs are those which are unlawful to possess or use. If you don't have a prescription for the diazepam that you have, or you've got a different kind of medication in a pill bottle that has your name on it, or uh, for alcohol or tobacco products if you're not of age, then that's a crime, and they'll treat you like a criminal. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's also deviant drug use to consider, uh, and uh, it's not common within a group. Uh, as drug use is not common within a group, uh, when I was talking a while ago about, uh, you know, unwinding in the afternoon with a can of beer, that's not that particularly deviant. It can be with some groups, but, uh, you know, society doesn't particularly frown on that. Society does particularly frown on, you know, coming home and drinking half a bottle of liquid hydrocodone. Uh, you know, that's deviant. And even deviancy that occurs within... Uh, that occurs in terms of the larger society may not be deviancy in terms of subgroups within that society, and those groups become deviant. Uh, you know, we and we have all kinds of subgroups that we can uh, point to. You know, drug users, heroin addicts, gang members, bikers. Uh, <coughs> I, uh, Bikers are a, a very interesting group of people, particularly those who uh, belong to a club. And I like to see, you know, ride to live and live to ride and uh, uh, slogans and live free or die and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, when I'm looking at a society, at, at a subculture that's so restrictive, it's... it's uh, uh, so regimented, it's, you know, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to believe that anyone can consider themselves being independent individuals within that culture, you know, uh, up to your bikes, your relationships, the colors that you wear, who can wear them, when they can wear them, yada, yada, yada. Uh, very restrictive. And there are subgroups like uh, in prison, and you uh, will probably have an uh, opportunity to encounter people who've been uh, in prison and who um, uh, they bring that prison culture out with them into the free world. And what worked in, in, in lockdown conditions, what worked in the institutions, don't work outside. Uh, and you can see that, and you can see the frustration, and, uh, and, and that's something that you'll have to address if you're working with people who are coming out of uh, being incarcerated. Uh, so, abuse, misuse, addiction, dependence, these are terminologies that we're going to have to think about moving forward, too. There are other important factors that we have to consider when we're talking about a drug problem, how we're going to define it. And that's where the language becomes important again. Uh, you know, 
if uh, you're going to make a change, any society that's going to make a change has to be able to define what the problem is, what they see as, uh, as an issue, and what they want to do to change it, and what the outcome should look like, and what the methodology should be, and there should be a, a, a manner of uh, addressing whether you know, whether you were successful or not, or if more needs to be done, or if it needs to be modified, etc. So, uh, we consider things when we're looking at people using drugs, such as correlates, uh, and correlates of drug use, data indicating relationships and behavior. Uh, people who, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in the day who used to go to raves, uh, were more likely to use drugs that were called club club drugs, uh, GHB and ecstasy and things like that, and dance the night away at the rave. Uh, that does not mean that using these drugs causes people to go to rave parties, and it does not mean that going to rave parties causes people to use these drugs. These are correlates. Uh, and you have to be careful with that, particularly if you're implying causality. I've known a lot of uh, opioid addicts, heroin addicts in my life, and you know what they have in common is every single uh, uh, heroin addict, opioid uh, dependent person that I've ever interviewed, you know what they did? They chewed gum before they became heroin addicts. They did, no kidding. Uh, and uh, most of them would cop to having chewed Wrigley's Juicy Fruit, which is a very famous brand of gum and even double mint, uh, which is, you know, even more sensation-seeking. Uh, and they all chewed gum before they ever shot heroin uh, the first time. So therefore, uh, it's pretty plain to say that chewing gum will cause you to be a heroin addict, right? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, it's a, uh, that's not, uh, that's a statistical correlate. Uh, I, I may just want to know how many heroin addicts chewed gum before they uh, shot heroin. But that's about where the relationship ends. There's no indication uh, in terms of causality. Uh, but correlates of drug use, uh, going to jail, getting divorced a lot, uh, losing jobs, you know, these are consequences and things that come along with that. Uh, and uh, sometimes people who are using drugs to cope, there are correlates that uh, uh, are actually antecedents, that things that occur prior to and are associated with drug use. You know, if I get, uh, if I have a fight with my wife, I use that as uh, an excuse to go drinking, etc. There are risk factors associated. Uh, with a uh, likelihood of drug use. Uh, and these are things uh, that um, uh, uh, that we look at and say, you know, you live in a poor neighborhood. You're, you have a, a, a history of alcoholism or mental illness or something like that in your family. Uh, you are risk factors through coming from a broken home, uh, economic factors, gang uh, associations, etc. Uh, you don't know much about uh, drinking and drug use, uh, and that uh, puts you at risk. You have a positive attitude toward using drugs. Protective factors are correlated uh, with uh, lower rates of drug use that. Uh, there are strong sanctions against uh, use at school or in society, and those are important to you. You don't want to get in trouble. Uh, you have uh, parents who are uh, supportive of you. You don't have a history of, uh, of substance abuse uh, disorder in uh, first degree blood relatives, et cetera. And those uh, then become, risk, uh, become protective factors. Uh, I got my slides out of order. Deviant drug use, drug misuse, abuse, addiction. I've talked about those, but my slides uh, out of order. 
I noticed it was missing back then, but I didn't say anything about it. I'll fix it, but you won't see it. Yeah, you will. You'll see it. I won't post this for you in your uh, uh, course run. There are personality variables that happens with people too. Uh, the addictive personality. What the hell is that addictive personality we've been looking for forever? Uh, human behavior it can be predictable if we see patterns emerging in past behaviors, but looking at uh, uh, you know past behaviors and saying something's going to happen and it's going to create this situation in the future becomes a little more iffy. Uh, addictive personalities, what are they like? Uh, well, they have poor impulse control. They do things you know, without much notice, without putting it through critical thinking, it just seems right at the time, and boom, we do it. We have low self-esteem. That's pretty true. Uh, you know, the things that we do to ourselves sometimes and that we allow other people to do to us and things like that indicate we don't think too highly of the old self. We don't have much tolerance for frustration uh, I know that most of you have uh, uh, have uh, uh, heard the serenity prayer at some point. God grant me the serenity to uh, accept the things I cannot change, uh, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, well, a lot of us do the short form of the serenity prayer, which is effort, right? Uh, and so there's a little tolerance for frustration. Uh, we, uh, some of us are very much into risk-taking behavior. We're kind of adrenaline and excitement junkies, too. And we, uh, uh, you know, like to push the envelope in a lot of areas of our life. Uh, and we don't have much resistance to peer pressure. Uh, you know, uh, I can be talked into a lot of things. And a few hundred other things that go into these uh, uh, personality studies. A thing about the addictive personality is that this is something that emerges very often through the process of addiction and it's not something that drives the process of addiction. And we'll talk about that later on too. It's not something that you, uh, you know, will have to uh, uh, be able to write a paper on here in this particular section anyway. Uh, genetics. Uh, here's the thing. Two things are at work going on here when we talk about genetics. One is that substance use in the family, substance use in any uh, circumstance is a learned behavior. And I do have people in my family uh, modeling for me what the family thinks, what the system thinks, what my parents think about drug use. My dad was a drinker. He was a heavy drinker uh, and got drunk quite often. My mother didn't drink at all. Uh, although she had been married, dad was the second alcoholic that she had been married to. Uh, and, uh, you know, more on that later maybe. Uh, but uh, uh, so there was drug use model to me in terms of alcohol. And then when I started, you know, growing up and went out, went around friends who were smoking weed and using other drugs, things like that, there was another modeling there. Uh, and choices were there to be made. Uh, so, and I can use the people that, uh, you know, uh, that I watch, the models in my life, and I can say, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to be. But I can also say, I don't want that. This is not who I want to be. And I've had some discussions about this with people and uh, uh, clients and uh, who tell me, well, well, my family didn't shape me, man, because they were screwed up as a soup sandwich. And I looked at everything that they did and said, I'm going to do something differently. Bingo, they shaped you. <laughs> you modeled your life on doing the opposite of what your father did. That's pretty shaping, wouldn't you agree? Uh, so that's a factor, and we can't get around that. Uh, and in my family, it was acceptable for men to drink, but not so much women. 
uh, and women were held to a different standard than men. And as I grew up and looked around, how about that? Society does the same thing. Uh, and um, we'll talk about that later on too. But substance use disorder as a genetic variable doesn't have anything to do, nothing whatsoever with what I think about it. Doesn't have anything to do whatsoever with what I believe, uh, the choices I make, any of that. It's something that happens to me biologically. And we'll talk about that later on too. Uh, but there is strong evidence to make an argument that, uh, you know, uh, there's something too uh, biologically to the idea that if you have alcoholic parents, you're four times more likely uh, to become alcoholic. Uh, to have an alcohol use disorder, to put it in more clinical terms, than someone who doesn't have uh, an um, alcoholic or substance use disorder parent. That's 400% more likely to become substance use disorder if there is uh, uh, that type of relationship in your family bloodline. This leads us to the gateway debate. Drug use is a learned behavior. Uh, and if you're going to be drinking and using drugs, then chances are you're gonna to have to learn how to do it. We'll talk about this in some other classes too. Uh, but, uh, you, uh, you know, when you, when you first started drinking, the first time you ever started, and I'm assuming that most of you have had a drink, uh, did you know how to do it, what to drink, how much to drink, what it was going to feel like, how you wanted to feel, uh, etc. No, it's experimentation. And you uh, learn. And you learn to adjust dosage, by the way. Remember, uh, you have <coughs> that uh, uh, the amount counts. It's not unusual for someone who's not used to drinking, for instance, to have a pronounced or much more pronounced response to the same dose of a drug uh, than someone who is accustomed to drinking. Why you don't want to go uh, driving around on New Year's Eve, man, it's amateur night. Uh, people who are uh, running around uh, going to bars and drinking and driving all of the time have done compensations for the, for the presence of the drug being in their body and stuff. Uh, people who don't uh, drink very regularly and go out to uh, uh, and have some on uh, New Year's Eve and then decide to drive, man, they are unguided missiles out there. You know? <laughs> They're very dangerous people to have on the road. What we call the gateway substances, though, uh, you know, uh, people learn to use them. You learn how to smoke a cigarette, right? You remember the first time, those of you that have tried it, the first time you ever, ever tried to inhale a cigarette and what your body told you? Boy, I do. I cough my guts out. Uh, the, uh, didn't think it was ever going to stop. It was horrible. Uh, and my body's saying, get this toxin out of me, and it's doing what it can to protect me, and I'm saying, shut up, I know what I'm doing, and taking another drag, because it looks cool to suck cigarette smoke into your uh, mouth and then blow it out your nose, right? What could be cooler than that? Uh, anyway, so uh, smoking cigarettes, taking a drink, uh, you know, if you keep up in the ante, uh, through your associations, uh, then uh, is this a gateway substance? Because I started smoking and uh, uh, fooling around with other things, chewing tobacco, drinking beer, that kind of stuff when I was young, uh, that moved me up to the point to one day I was sitting there with the choice to make about whether to uh, uh, put a needle in my arm and inject some uh, uh, illicit drugs in there. Uh, and it didn't seem so weird at that point, uh, and I chose yes, uh, is that, um, you know, is that the gateway that I, I walked through? This isn't an easy open and shut question, actually, 
research doesn't support the gateway theory that uh, uh, because I smoke cigarettes, I eventually wound up using injectable drugs and other type of drugs and, you know, uh, becoming a alcohol use disorder or whatever. Uh, it doesn't support that. A lot of people who uh, uh, smoke cigarettes or start smoking cigarettes or even start drinking alcohol, they do not progress into harder drugs. And their use of the drugs that they do start using, the gateway substances, uh, don't progress into a more serious form. Uh, they just either stay where they are, they moderate down if they start having problems, and some of them do it for a while and just quit, don't, you know, uh, which is um, a, a very reasonable and responsible thing to do. Um, it's more likely that when we're talking about this, that early alcohol use and cigarette smoking, they're common indicators of uh, that one personality trait that I think, uh, 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 that I think, uh, uh, Leads, in, leads more of us into trouble than anything else, and that's the thrill seeking. Uh, you know, uh, I want to be deviant. I'm going to do this because, you know, because they told me not to. <laughs> you know, they said, I can't get away with it. Watch this. It's like when my dad was spanking me when I was a kid, and he'd say things when he's smacking me, you know, like, don't you ever let me catch you doing that again. And I'm dancing around trying to keep my butt out of his way and uh, thinking to myself, don't worry, you won't catch me doing that again, by the way. Uh, didn't occur to me to stop doing what I was doing just to cover my tracks better. Uh, maybe that is a deviant personality. It's pretty embedded, though. Uh, there's uh, an increased likelihood of smoking marijuana or trying cocaine among people like that. And it's not because they were exposed to cigarettes and alcohol uh, early on. So in conclusion uh, with uh, uh, chapter one, uh, there, there are many prob drug problems found in societies. They're not one thing. And if you, uh, you know, ask the cop is about how to enforce the laws. If you ask the lawyers about how to prosecute or how to uh, launch a defense, uh, if you uh, uh, ask the drug addict, it's because I'm out of dope and I have no money, <laughs> you know? Uh, so there's, uh, uh, it depends on who, who you're talking to. It's also important if we're to address uh, problems that we're careful to define them use specific language in our discussions. When we get to chapter three, we're gonna see some legal responses that never quite panned out the way we thought they would, and a lot of it has to do with language. Uh, substance use disorders are not behaviors that individuals choose, but poor decisions are a component of the disorder. The, uh, substance use disorder, people make a lot of bad choices. Uh, but being substance use disordered is not one of them. We looked at the, the, all of those plethora of reasons that people might use drugs, but uh, uh, not all of them are particularly problematic and not all of them, uh, you know, provide evidence that, uh, that uh, these choices were uh, what led to the, to the addiction. In, in short, that uh, people don't choose to be drug addicts. Most people who use psychoactive substances, and this is something that you need to consider uh, uh, every day when we're out there walking around and talking to people and they're asking us questions and we're trying to answer them, is that most people who use psychoactive substances do not become addicted to them. They don't. Uh, not to crack, not to heroin not to pain medications, not to alcohol, not to cigarettes even, although cigarettes are probably the most addictive substance that we've got going out there. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, they try them. Some of them may even use them uh, on a fairly regular basis, but they don't uh, fall into the uh, uh, addiction category. We cannot diagnose them. 
uh, and they can have problems with that addiction as well, but they are, uh, again, uh, not diagnosable. So, chapter two, drug use is a social problem. Now, this won't take too long, but, uh, and again, I'll post these slides uh, on in your classroom where you can have access to them. And of course, you can always uh, watch this video. What in the hell is the drug problem anyway? Remember we asked that in the last uh, uh, lecture just a few minutes ago? It's a good question, glad you asked it again. It's a legal issue, it's a moral issue, it's a supply issue, it's a medical issue, it's an illness, it's a crime, it's a choice. Uh, it is and is not <laughs> all of these things. Uh, clear enough? Pretty vague, huh? Uh, but uh, this is something we've got to work on. It's something that you'll be working on in your practices. We usually look at three processes by which we try to make a, determine of, uh, a determination of uh, what the drug problem is. And for you and I, uh, substance use disorder is the drug, uh, is the drug problem. And it uh, uh, meets diagnostic criteria that's laid out in the DSM-5. Uh, it's diagnosable. It uh, is something that we can uh, uh, make a determination of. We can evaluate it for severity. Uh, we can treat it. We can uh, have successful treatment. It can be, it can be arrested, uh, and there can be successful outcomes. But we look at uh, the processes of toxicity, dependence, uh, and to some extent, crime, and looking at how this is expressed societally. Toxicity is the first thing that we need to look at. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, drugs that are toxic that may not be particularly uh, psychoactive. Um, if you and, and and if you're taking something like Vicodin, for instance, Vicodin is something that you build a tolerance on, and it's a toxic drug. It can certainly overdose you and kill you if you take too much of it. But a problem that we see with people uh, who are taking very large dosages of Vicodin over time is not just the hydrocodone uh, that's in it. That's uh, Cre creating the addiction problem, but there's a lot of acetaminophen in it as well, Tylenol, uh, which is another analgesic substance, but high dosages of, uh, uh, of the analgesic uh, acetaminophen uh, can really whack your liver. Uh, and so the, the toxic effect of doing a lot of Vicodin over time may not be the hydrocodone creating the toxic effect as much as it is the acetaminophen because you're taking way too much of that. Uh, toxic simply means poison. And if a substance is toxic, it's a poisonous substance. So what does it mean to be intoxicated? See that root word right here? That, uh, oh, uh, toxic is right in the middle of intoxicated. Uh, and that means that when you drink a lot of alcohol, for instance, and you slur your word and you reach for your drink and knock it off the counter and uh, you're struggling to stay upright on that rolling bar stool that's trying to buck you off, uh, and you get up and you stagger away with a wide gated uh, walk uh, because your balance is shot to hell, uh, that's intoxicated. You are exhibiting the symptomologies of being poisoned. Uh, I'll talk to you about this in other classes too. Uh, but uh, all alcohols, for instance, are poisonous to human beings. Ethyl alcohol is the least poisonous, which means we can drink more of it uh, without dying than we can uh, uh, of isopropanol or uh, butanol or you know something along, uh, along those lines. Uh, I stopped for a drink of water. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, toxicity is a big deal. Uh, how much is too much? Well, you can die directly from alcohol-related poisoning. We'll talk about that uh, in some other settings, uh, of course. But uh, usually when you do that, you drink too much, you pass out, uh, and you vomit and then drown in the vomit. Or uh, you drink too much and you pass out. You put to sleep the part of the brain that controls breathing. You stop breathing and you die of respiratory arrest. Toxicity occurs with a lot of different drugs. Approximately 70,000 OD deaths in 2018 involved uh, opioids and opiates, while at the same time, almost half a million people died of illnesses related directly uh, to, uh, to tobacco use. Alcohol and tobacco use is without a doubt the most serious drug problem in terms of human life that America faces in terms of toxicity of the substances. Uh, there's acute toxicity versus chronic toxicity, though. Uh, acute toxicity uh, may occur to me and, uh, now because I, uh, Howard's drunk right now. He had a fifth of Jim Beam and he's staggering all over the place and he's vomiting for both distance and trajectory. Uh, that, that kind of thing. That's an acute toxicity situation. I could pass out. It could be life-threatening. <clears throat> but if I don't die, tomorrow I'll sober up. And I may have a hangover, but other than that, I'll go on with my life. That's an acute intoxication event that's related to acute toxicity. Chronic toxicity, on the other hand, is uh, Howard's drunk right now and he has cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, and tomorrow, when he sobers up, he'll still have cirrhosis of the liver, but it will be worse t tomorrow than it is today because of the fifth of Jim Beam that Howard put in him. Uh, and it's going to eventually kill him. Uh, it's going to be a likelihood there. That's toxicity. Dependence is another thing. One of my old mentors uh, was a guy named Spencer Andrews. He was a Kadak. I met Spencer in 1985, uh, and uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, working. I was leading groups for Dr. Jason Barron, going to school, learn how to be a, uh, what at the time was called a certified alcoholism and drug abuse counselor or a Kadak. Uh, anyway. Uh, the, uh, and that's what Spencer was. And we were talking one day when I first came to work there and I admired Spence very much. Uh, and he taught me a lot, he did. Uh, but he said, if you wanna know if a guy's an addict, take away his dope and watch what happens. That's the best thing to do. Uh, and uh, there's much truth to that. If you're in a controlled situation where you can take a person's drugs away from them and watch what they do, they'll pretty much tell you how important that uh, substance is to them and what their relationship with it is. Uh, but there are types of dependences. Physical dependence versus psychological dependence. If I've got a heroin addict on my hands and all I have to do is, uh, uh, is uh, get him off of the drug, you know, to, to detoxify him from that drug, Heck, I can tie him up in a garage, you know, chain him to a, uh, to a post out there and uh, throw him a sandwich every once in a while, make sure his creature needs are taken care of. In roughly two weeks' time, a little less, uh, he will have gone through his withdrawal uh, and, uh, you know, there won't be any more problems. He's, you know, he's not going to be dope sick anymore. He's not going to be having, uh, you know, the the cold turkey, the vomiting, the diarrhea, the cramps, the bone aches, the hot flashes and cold chills and all the nasty stuff that goes along with that. Uh, but I will not have cured him of his physical dependence. And I will not have addressed his psychological dependence. And along with that physical dependence is the psychological dependence. I have seen physical dependence 
dependence develop without psychological dependence. Uh, the case I described uh, earlier, uh, when with taking the medication as prescribed by the doctor, I didn't trigger a psychological dependence, but my body had a physical, physiological one, uh, you know, and I, I, again, I had withdrawal. Uh, and my withdrawal, by the way, from that was relatively minor because I wasn't using the drug for, you know, for that particular length of time. But I made physiological changes through my body, uh, uh, through my experience, through my use of substances over time. And so I kind of set the stage. And this is a problem uh, that we'll encounter uh, with recovering people who, as we age, uh, you know, and, and other illnesses happen to us and things like that, we're often going to be, and Spencer was one of them, uh, you know, during the last years of his life, uh, they gave him a lot of drugs, and I mean, poor Spence struggled with those and struggled with those. Not because, you know, he was a bad actor or he was seeking a high or anything like that, but because of his physical dependency. Uh, and if you are someone who is um, who has a physical dependency, then you're going to have to be very careful uh, with your medications, what you use and how you use them. Uh, and... Uh, uh, there's a, uh, another big lecture on that in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, psychological dependence is another thing. I cut my heroin addict that I've had chained up out in the garage. I cut him loose, and he leaves footprints right up the middle of me going to uh, uh, contact uh, his uh, uh, supplier because he has been focused on this very moment uh, throughout my whole uh, Adolf Eichmann true, uh, School of Detoxification uh, of um, getting that next high. So away he goes. He's been uh, craving and fantasizing and thinking and longing for this. That's dependence. That's the dependence that's more difficult to deal with than the physical drive. Although the physical sick is a very, very powerful negative reinforcement for someone uh, to go and get high again. Yeah, but it's a crime. And drug use does all kinds of things with crime, right? Uh, quote from my little brother. If you want to end crime, get rid of laws. If it ain't illegal, it ain't a crime. Uh, and he had a point <laughs> on that. Uh, and we talked about drug-induced crime. That's the things that you do uh, when you're high. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the drug that's most closely associated with that, again, is alcohol. Drug-related crime is stealing things to, uh, uh, to get high, uh, you know, hitting your mom's purse and taking her uh, cash out of that, hocking things uh, out of the house down at the pawn shop, uh, uh, burglarizing places, uh, stuff like that. Uh, that's uh, uh, drug-related crime. Drug-induced crime is, uh, again, like I say, it's something that uh, that we uh, uh, that we uh, uh, you know get drunk and decide to start a fight with someone, uh, get drunk and sexually assault someone. Uh, we'll talk about this more in depth moving forward uh, again, but. You know, if you're if you're murdered in the United States, chances are it's not going to be a stranger who does it. It's going to be someone you know. Uh, chances are real good that one or both of you are going to be under the influence of a drug. Chances are excellent that that drug will be alcohol. Uh, if you're right in the United States of America, it's probably not going to be by a stranger, uh, but it will be. Uh, you know, by someone you know, and chances are excellent, again, that uh, uh, one or both of you will be under the influence of a drug, and that drug will be alcohol. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about in uh, substance use and crime. Uh, these are uh, two books. Uh, these were written, uh, The Cross and the Switchblade, was published in 1962, and then a few years later, uh, uh, and this was written by uh, David Wilkerson and a ghostwriter. 
and uh, Nikki Cruz and a ghost writer did Run Baby Run. But uh, uh, David Wilkerson was a country preacher of an Assembly of God church up in Pennsylvania who read about a crime in New York City where there were seven defendants were accused of stabbing a, 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 a boy to death, a boy who had uh, polio. And uh, Wilkerson uh, was moved, uh, felt that he was called by God to go up there and uh, uh, minister to these kids, which he did, uh, the ones who were, uh, uh, who were being accused of... Uh, who were being accused of uh, uh, something going on in my house. Uh, sorry about that. It sounded like someone was parking a Buick in the kitchen. Uh, anyway, so he went, up to, he went up to New York and started a straight ministry. Uh, the quote is from uh, one of the uh, women, the uh, gang members, the Debs, as they called them. Uh, uh, and uh, Rosa asked him, said, hey, preach this God of yours. What's he going to do for me? I'm a mainliner. You know, the hot stuff, heroin, a whole mountain of snow white. That's heaven. What have you got, huh? Uh, and that's... Uh, uh, a really powerful description of the relationship sometimes that a heroin addict has with uh, with with their drug. Nikki Cruz was a, a member of the Mau Mau's, the New York street gang, uh, and he was from a small uh, village in Puerto Rico, and his uh, uh, parents uh, were uh, basically witches. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, he was sent to New York to live with his brother and immediately got into trouble with um, uh, with the street gangs and what have you. Uh, anyway, uh, Wilkerson uh, went up in through his street ministry. Uh, he helped uh, Nikki uh, convert. Uh, to Christianity, to uh, you know, to have a spiritual awakening, what have you. And Nicky went away and became a preacher himself. Uh, and uh, Wilkerson started a, a movement that uh, uh, became a real big deal in the in the United States, and that was Teen Challenge. Uh, if you uh, have read the books, uh, Wilkerson talked about. Uh, coming out of the courthouse the first time he went up and saw the boys who were on trial for murder. Uh, and uh, a reporter asked him, what's that book you carry? And you ashamed of it? Uh, and Wilkerson says, no, it's my Bible. I'm not ashamed of it. And he said, well, hold it up where we can see it. Uh, and Wilkerson made the mistake of holding it up where he could see it. Uh, and uh, suddenly he became uh, uh you know, kind of known as a crackpot Bible thumper, uh, and the image was used against him somewhat. Uh, not to mention any names, but you'd think a certain president could have learned something, you know, from that before running out in public and holding up a Bible. Uh, but anyway, uh, got kind of the same effect. This is Nikki. Uh, actually, this is uh, Nikki a few years ago. Uh, he's in his 80s now, but he's still with uh, Teen Challenge out in uh, uh, Southern California. And this is uh, him in uh, uh, Photoshop with a, uh, a picture of uh, Wilkerson. Wilkerson died in, uh, I think it was 2011, if I'm not mistaken. He uh, he was in his 80s. He was too old uh, uh, and had medical conditions to be driving, but he was driving anyway, not wearing a seat belt, crossed the line, had a head on, and that was that. Uh, but Teen Challenge moves forward, uh, and uh, the 
small operation that Wilkerson started in 1961 now has more than uh, 1,400 accommodation centers in 125 countries around the world. So uh, Teen Challenge is somewhat ubiquitous. Uh, and uh, the focus of Teen Challenge was working with street teens. So these were kids who, you know, had no place, had no one, uh, you know, and consequently joined gangs uh, through that. This is a, a graduating class of uh, the uh, uh, Teen Challenge boys in Kentucky, and here's some of uh, uh, the graduates of the Southern uh, California Ventura class uh, of uh, three years ago. And all of this grew out of a perceived need to, uh, to come in and fill a gap uh, in the lives of these uh, youngsters, which is exactly uh, what Wilkerson did and exactly what Cruz did when he, when he came back. I, I don't know if Nicky's still lecturing or not, but he was in, uh, he was in Houston a few years uh, back uh, on uh, the Mayor's Drug Initiative Day. You know, delivered a really. You know, he's a he's a, he's a terrifically engaging uh, uh, speaker, and if you get a chance to hear him, uh, you ought to for a couple of reasons. One is because he's a really engaging uh, speaker, and now he's like eighty five years old. You know, so uh, don't put off till tomorrow. <laughs> you know, oh, a Teen Challenge, by the way is not without controversy. It is a religious uh, uh, organization and a number of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, the successful uh, and recognizable drug treatment initiatives are, uh, are also religious or spiritual in nature. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, you know, they're, they're considered spiritual answers to uh, to the addiction problem. Uh, Palmer Drug Abuse Program uh, that Father Charlie and Bob Meehan and John Bradshaw got organized in the basement of, uh, uh, of uh, on the bottom floor, not the basement, of Palmer Episcopal Church in Houston, uh, you know, uh, directed towards teenagers and and uh, others as well. So there's Odyssey House, lots of them. But Teen Challenge is associated with the Assembly of God Church. Uh, although, uh, uh, although he was a Millerite, uh, Wilkerson was believed that denominational stuff separated Christians. It's not a you know, and that that wasn't good. That you know, they they should be. United, uh, but uh, anyway, his uh, organization has been um, uh, challenged at, uh, at a number of locations for being too strict, sometimes even abusive uh, with the people uh, who are there, uh, and uh, you know, not an uncommon allegation to be uh, you know leveled at a religious organization or entity, uh, and that. Um, uh, uh, that several of the uh, several of the locations were engaged in uh, the uh, uh, very unpopular and uh, very useless uh, attempts at conversion therapy to make uh, homosexuals not homosexual anymore. Is substance use disorder? really an illness though. Uh, people have a religious experience and they convert and, uh, and their problems go away. Uh, no, not really. Uh, and, it, uh, and it doesn't, uh, you know, I, told, uh, I mentioned a while ago that I'd seen a person who had the physiological illness without the, uh, uh, without the uh, psychological dependence uh, and uh, uh, one of those that jumps to mind, and I've seen several of them, but one of those that jumped to mind was a Presbyterian minister. And, uh, you know, he was an older guy, 
uh, and this, uh, you know, he's probably dead now, it's been a long time ago, uh, but he was in his 60s then, and uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, that his, uh, uh, that uh, he, I don't know if it was like the church people or who it was, but anyway, he wound up in my office over on Center Street in Deer Park, uh, and uh, I told him, well, you know, what you're experiencing right now is withdrawal syndrome, and you need, you know, you need to be under the care of a doctor to, you know, to have this uh, uh, looked at. And he says, how can that be? He said, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, I, I, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not partying. I'm not getting high. I'm not doing any. I'm not doing anything uh, that I wasn't supposed to do. How could you know? And I'm, I'm a man of God. How could this happen to me? Uh, and he was sincerely puzzled. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, part of what we do is helping people to understand that this uh, occurs independently of who you are. All of these people are subject to the same disorder. Uh, you know, and uh, did some of them want to get high and seek partying? Yes, they did. Some of them were following their doctor's prescription. Some of them, you know, had been raised in families and in communities and things like that where drinking was acceptable and okay. Uh, and a thing that's kind of hard to get your head around when you're a chemically dependent or substance use disordered individual is why me? Why did this happen to me? I look around me and other people are doing the same thing that I'm doing, but they're not getting in trouble with it. Other people, uh, you know, uh, have a drink now and then and everything's fine. Other people can take their medication and not have to worry about titrating the dosage down so that I don't have withdrawal. Why me? Um, well, and I think the only real answer to that and it's not a very satisfying one, is why not you? Uh, you know, uh, none of us are exempt. This can happen to, to anyone. And like I said, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it's a real one. And yet, uh, uh, substance use disorder is primary. It's a disease in itself. Uh, it's not a symptom of something else. It's, you didn't get this because, you know, uh, you didn't get a pony when you were seven, uh, or, you know, daddy left, or mommy's mean, or whatever. It's chronic. Once you have it, it doesn't go away. We'll talk about that in uh, another context. We'll talk about all of this in another context more in depth. It's progressive. It gets worse over time, and it's fatal in a number of ways. It's a multivariate syndrome. It's a complicated illness. It consists of a lot of symptoms, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that we can measure, we can diagnose, we can identify them, uh, and that's uh, uh, and it responds to treatment. It can be arrested. It can be treated, uh, and there are uh, uh, you know, and not everyone's treated in the same way. Not everyone wants the same outcome. Uh, so there's. Uh, a number of different approaches uh, to different ends, different to, towards different goals. Uh, and no, uh, addicts don't really choose to use. Uh, we it's complicated, and I, and I don't mean that in a facetious way. It really is complicated. Uh, what happens when, uh, uh, especially the white knuckle people who are doing their very best not to drink uh, or you know not to get in trouble, and then. Uh, we think, you know, well, one won't hurt, uh, and uh, yes, it will. And loss of control is a big, big component of what we see uh, with people who uh, uh, who have this particular disorder. There's an old saying in AA that when you get killed by the train, by a train. It's the engine that gets you, not the caboose. It's the first drink uh, that hits you, uh, not the last one. Uh, we talked about the three processes of uh, dependence the, uh, to some degree, the, uh, but uh, uh, about physical dependence and uh, psychological dependence. 
uh, and tolerance is something else that has to be considered. Tolerance refers to a diminished response to the same dose of a drug over time. And abnormal tolerances indicate an increased likelihood of substance use disorders and dependence. If uh, 10 of us, uh, you know, decide to do an experiment and uh, uh, all of us drink a pint of whiskey, say in the next 20 minutes, we're going to drink a pint of whiskey. Uh, out of that 10, eight of you are going to be pretty, eight of us, uh, I'm including myself in the 10, uh, me, uh, and nine of you out <laughs> of ten, eight of you are going to be wiped out by that pint of whiskey. Uh, you know, a pint of whiskey in 20 minutes is a lot of whiskey. Uh, some of you are going to be passed out. Some of you are going to be puking. So all of you will be staggering around pretty much, except for me and one other person. And we're going to be saying to one another, ah, look at these lightweights. Let's go dancing. Uh, and out of that group of people, there's some abnormal tolerance there. Who do you think the abnormal people in the room are? Yeah, I, absolutely right. It's me and that one other person who's saying, let's go dancing. Everybody else is reacting the way you'd expect someone to act after they have drunk a pint of whiskey in 20 minutes. They're affected by it visibly affected by it, and this, uh, their behaviors changed, et cetera, and so forth. So when you have people who are telling you, I can't be an alcoholic, man, I can drink enough alcohol to float a boat. <laughs> you know? When my friends are all passed out and stuff, I can still walk a straight line. You know, I can't have a problem. Uh, that is a problem, and that indicates a problem. This is an abnormal tolerance. Uh, and if suddenly well, you find yourself that, uh, uh, you know, when you started using, it didn't hit you as hard as it hit your friends. Uh, and after a period of time, you know, you're, look, you're having to jack your dosage up to get to where you used to go on less. That is uh, a very common toler uh, tolerance indicate of, uh, uh, of developing dependency of a substance use disorder. Anyway, in conclusion, addiction is not caused by the substance alone. If it was, everybody who drank would become an alcoholic. But most drinkers don't become alcoholic. Everyone who used an opiate would become an opiate addict. But most people who use opiates do not become opiate addicts. They don't even abuse them. There does not seem to be an addictive personality that's predetermined uh, to become addicted. However, one certainly emerges through the progression of the illness. You see these character traits emerge as one goes uh, uh, through uh, the process of uh, developing addiction. And drug use and crime are interrelated, but they're not interrelated in a causal way. And again, looking at antecedents and correlates and things like that require uh, a lot of attention on our part uh, so that we um, uh, don't jump to conclusions. And we'll talk about that some more too because this first lecture is just an overview. Uh, and we'll get a little more specific as we go forward. And that is that for the uh, for the first uh, for the first lecture, and um, I hope it's useful to you. I hope you enjoy it. Um, these will be coming along weekly uh, as you go over your um, um, readings and other assignments that are posted in your classroom. I, and like I said, I hope that you find them uh, helpful. Uh, I. Uh, I've always liked lectures personally as a, as a learner uh, and uh, get a lot out of them. So if you do, you do. And if you don't, you have to watch them anyway. So there. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, 
that's the end of it today. I hope you have a, a pleasant week. Uh, as I'm recording this, it's pushing into the week before Christmas. I hope you have great holidays and, every, and, and get everything that you want and all that kind of good stuff. And see you next time.